The Legendarium Podcast is brought to you by, by you. So please visit patreon.com slash legendarium to, to support, support the show. But for now, welcome, welcome to, to the, the Legendarium. Legendarium. Just write, just do, just go and do that because even some of the greatest works like Frankenstein here are, are retellings of existing stories. So just do it. I'm going to Shia LaBeouf this right here. Just <laughs> do it. Just do it. Do it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. <laughs> uh, all right. I think I'm ready. Y'all ready? Welcome, everybody, to the Legendarium Podcast. This is episode 200 and, and something that is up for debate. We'll talk about that in just a second. But for now, I am Craig Hanks, your host. For now, you're Craig? Well, for now. It's conditional. It's <laughs> <laughs> surgery scheduled next week. Uh, if you're <laughs> So here's the rest of the panel. If you're ever trying to stitch him up and you realize that would be a horrible mistake, you're right. But don't panic. Just throw him in the lake. It's Kyle Lemon. I, I got nothing for that. Yeah, that's you fine. just throw me in the lake. And his feet are so hairy, even blind villagers flee from him in terror. It's Ryan Bruckman. And just as flammable as the torch this they carry. <laughs> exactly. Right? Uh, okay, so today we are talking about Frankenstein. Uh, this is our special Halloween episode. There is possibly, we teased a Goosebumps episode uh, mm -hmm. during episode 200. I, I don't know what has become of that. I think that Blue Team is still planning on recording that, but it may come out after Halloween. I don't know. Um, we'll see. That's okay. It's an exploration of a, a classic literature on both ends for us. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. One of us. Yes. One of us does the classic uh, 19th century tale of, uh, of science fiction misery and woe, and uh, and we do Frankenstein. And, and we do Frankenstein. Exactly right. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I, either way, I don't know if this is episode two or one or two o two. That's the that's the debate. We'll see. Either way, both of them will come. Two o one a. Um, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Because, <laughs> uh, and, uh, anyway, that doesn't matter. All right, everybody, support the, pay, uh, support the show at patreon.com slash legendarium. Join the conversation at uh, thelegendarium.reddit.com and also join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, YouTube, um, just all of them, all of them. And Craig's on Grinder. <laughs> Swipe right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so. Uh, where are we with other stuff? Oh, I was also, I'm sorry, before I go on, um, if you are keeping up with the podcast, I know that plenty of people will listen to this in three years and you won't care about this, so skip ahead 30 seconds. Uh, but there was just an announcement about Patreon and Reddit teaming up. Um, wow. You're going to be able to uh, do some kind of reward stuff between the two platforms. Uh, so I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that. I think they're going to roll that out next month. Uh, so look for that. Look for a change in the uh, Patreon tiers and how we handle those. Uh, the other thing that we're doing today, just to tease it for you, we are D and D campaigning today. We're gonna play Dungeons and Dragons for the second time in our lives. Uh, right, Ryan, you haven't played it since then. Nope. Okay. So we played it once in friggin' like 2013 or something like that, or whenever it was, 2015, and. Uh, can you handle the D and D? <laughs> so we're gonna play it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna record it. We're gonna <laughs> tape it, and uh, that will live solely on Patreon. Uh, so there will be some exclusive Patreon content coming up uh, that you may not want to miss out on if you enjoy uh, middle-aged, worthless men uh, playing a young people's game poorly. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So, all right, now on to Frankenstein. Uh, I have not read this book since high school. Uh, would that be the yeah, case for you guys accurate. as well? It's been a long time. Yeah. I graduated high school <laughs> years ago. And uh, <laughs> now, yeah, I, I'd forgotten most of it. I remembered a few scenes, a few images from the book, but I hadn't retained most of it. And so this was quite an adventure for me. And I have to say, from page one, I was in love. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Not just like, not just as a, uh, not just as an artifact of uh, romantic literature, which it is, and not just for the first science fiction novel, which it is, and not just because this is only the second book that we've ever done by a female author, which it is, but 
because it's legitimately really well written, mm-hmm. a ton of fun. Uh, but it also, you know, it's a ton of th- of fun. But it also makes you think a lot. It's got a lot of uh, a lot of meaty bits, much like the monster himself. So, Ryan, how reason- did you enjoy this? I was gonna say, there's a reason this book is considered a classic and has lasted as long as it has, uh, because of how well it's written and how enjoyable it is. And I had a very, I'd say, my exp- my experience coming back to it was very similar. Starting out at the beginning, first thing was my mind having to wrap around going. This is not the writing style you've been reading in the last year or <laughs> <Right>. two. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, the first is, few pages took quite a long time for me to read and get back into that mode. Yeah, it was a brain engage while reading. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was nice, and uh, it I enjoyed at the beginning here the epistolic beginning, um, going the letters uh, before we jumped into it. It, it kind of having just come off King Killer not too long ago where we have kind of a frame story inside of another, it was like, hey, this this is not a new concept. This has been done mm-hmm. before here. And this is one of the, one example of that. And I liked it. Um, yeah, I I am so glad also to get back in and read a classic. I think a, a classic in the middle of everything else that we mm-hmm. do is, is a good, not palate cleanser because I think it's a lot. This is heavy stuff. Heavy, but um, it's definitely worth worth doing. So Definitely a good change of pace. Yeah. yeah, we uh we just finished Gentleman Bastards and now we're getting into Farseer and this is in no way uh reflection on my opinion this is not my opinion on the quality of the work but I have had the toughest time starting Farseer and getting into it because of what you just said like we we read these huge series and we get involved in these characters and those worlds and so yeah it's nice to yeah to do uh, what is 200 250 pages dense pages sure granted but you know 250 pages of uh you know, a, a one-off story that's a classic and it's a ton of fun and it's yeah. interesting to talk about so yeah this is fantastic kyle what did you think yeah i mean jumping in for me it was pretty much what you two said as well i hadn't read it since high school long time ago Honestly, I for I totally forgot that there was a frame story and that there were the letters that he's writing. Frame story. And I opened up opened it and I started reading it and I got down past the first page and then I closed the book again to look at the front cover to make sure it was Frankenstein. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, "Oh yeah, okay, this is not what I remember, but yeah. here we go." And then, yeah, like I like you were saying, I think right from the get-go, I was it took me a minute to switch my brain, uh, but super engaged. I love I love the classics. So, so Kyle, you were an English major. Yep. You taught English. Yep. Uh, at a junior high level, so you probably didn't get into much Frankenstein. No. Nope. But uh, but anyway, you've been kind of immersed in in this sort of mm-hmm. classic literature, maybe a little more than we have. Uh, and you probably know the most out of the three of us about the people surrounding this book not just mary shelley but the people around her can you give us a little bit of background on who she was where she wrote it what was going on with her um yeah i don't i off the I, top of my head that's a lot but yeah i'm not me, i'm not looking for super detailed sure. stuff anyway uh basically uh mary shelley was married to percy shelley who was right. another romantic poet fa- famous for ozymandias um if you've ever read that um one of the biggest like famous groupings is that Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron were all contemporaries and basically all like got together one summer and hung out at this cottage they were, castle. If they were here today, they'd be doing a podcast. Exactly. Um, hundred percent. I mean, uh, look for our classic works on your shelves soon. <laughs> <laughs> so they, these are all like some of the biggest names in the romantic era, as far as authors and poets are concerned. And to put it in perspective for today, like we joke about it, like getting together for a podcast, but it would literally be like if you had from a fantasy perspective, if you had George Martin, Brandon Sanderson and J.K. Rowling all go hang out at a college at a cottage for a summer in Geneva and and write stories yeah, Yeah, in Geneva and write stories. And where do we kickstarter that? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so super well-known, renowned poets authors obviously mary shelley wrote frankenstein the other thing but she she was was she this was her first big success wasn't it and and it wasn't even published under her name at first if i recall correctly so what she actually did um she wrote her own things and this was her big success but one of the bigger things that she did that doesn't get talked about as much is that she actually 
edited a lot of work for her husband. Oh, sure. Um, and so he was kind of the one that was... Whose name was out there Yeah, his name was out yeah. there, well known. He was the poet, and she was the one behind the scenes editing for him. Yeah. Um, which is super cool. But, yeah, I mean, okay. that's she kind wrote of the, this the gist she, of it. She started writing this when she was 18 as well. Oh, jeez. Like, that's, it's incredible. Um, it makes me feel really bad about myself. I mean, admittedly, she's in the same time period of life as we are now in terms of, you know, how soon you die, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> but yeah, I mean, all three of them were very... They're part of that sublime era where they talk about... I don't know what that means, that sublime ta- era. Well, they talk... What, what sublime it is, for me is a very different connotation yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen to sublime. As, yeah. as a child of the 80s, that means <laughs> something different. Basically, what it is is like, na- like they look at the divine, divine sublime nature of nature sure okay and like the emotions very, very romantic yeah the sentiment. emotions that come from the natural world yep um that they, was that was one of my favorite things about this about reading this book right now in my life um and all of the the denseness of this book that the stuff that you know if you handed this to a modern author or sorry a modern editor that editor would probably say, oh, there's a lot of filler in this. We don't need this discussion. We don't need that. That was actually some of my favorite stuff, especially toward the beginning um, when Victor is talking about um, his experience at the school and the kind of things that he was interested in and what his professors wanted him to be interested in. Uh, The reason I'm so tickled about this and having read it now is that for the last, I don't know, six months or something, I've I've been not exactly immersed, but really interested in and learning a lot more about the idea of romant- the romantic period and mm-hmm. romanticism yeah. per se. And it's uh, apparently an extremely slippery term. And so you have to be really careful because everybody has their own definition of, you know, their own kind of special definition of what romantic is. But um, specifically, I'm learning about romanticism versus the enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Uh, the enlightenment being you know all the the science and the learning and the uh reason based thinking that came along 500 years ago and really picked up a lot of steam through the 18th century and all that um and then you have the romantics who kind of pushed against that mm-hmm. and they're like no you can't you can't reason your way into knowing certain things and nature has uh you know nature reigns supreme mm-hmm. and so you know when victor is kind of uh feeling really melancholy after what's her name gets uh, executed um oh yeah what, what's um, justine or yeah uh after she gets executed he goes up and he's like i've gotta i've gotta repair my soul and mm-hmm. so he's like i'm gonna go up into the mountains and watch a bunch of sunrises and mm-hmm. uh, this is an extremely extremely popular thing to do now actually mm-hmm. anyway so this uh if you if you want to learn more about that i would really encourage if you want to understand what was going on in Frankenstein and a lot of the books that were published around then, learn about uh, the Romantics and their opposition to many of the principles of the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And so you have like John Locke, who represents the Enlightenment, mm-hmm. and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French dude, who mm-hmm. represents the the Romantic uh, sentiments that we're talking about. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but you can still learn about those two and and kind of understand the the ideas they were coming at. And the reason I bring that up is because it's not only this uh, this enlightenment versus romanticism is not only important to understand books like this, but it's uh, it's an ongoing debate now. It's a live debate now. You know, how much do we how much do we consider ourselves reason based thinkers, um, scientific thinkers? And how much are we kind of um, superstitious and, mm-hmm. you know, revering nature and uh, all of that sort of thing? It's um, it's a divide that not only existed back then, but it's a divide that exists now. And lest you think <laughs> that you are wholly on one side or the other, I think it's a line that divides the heart of every mm-hmm. person, not just every movement yeah. or every nation or something, that we're constantly at war with our nature Mm -hmm. and uh, well it's well it's it's interesting too because all three of them byron uh percy shelley and mary shelley were heavily influenced by milton and paradise lost 
In fact, she actually references Paradise right. Lost in the book. A couple of times, yeah. And just like tying that back to they they're trying to figure out how nature and the sublime fits into their belief system, but also connecting it back to that Christianity that Milton's talking about. Uh, yeah. So I, like Craig was saying, I think having that background information or those, those influences in the back of your mind, as you read through this story will make you see it in a different way. It's yeah. And it, it's not only about helping you understand the book itself, which I think is extremely valuable and necessary, mm -hmm but it's also about making the book mean something to you, mm -hmm. giving it some sort of applicability and seeing the, the uh, conversations between the monster and Frankenstein um, and seeing the conversations between Frankenstein and his professors and stuff, recognizing that war that exists within you as well mm -hmm. makes the book more personally applicable than it might otherwise be if it was just, oh, there's a dude who created a monster. Which I think is why, to Ryan's point earlier, why it has the staying power that it does, why it's been around for so long. Oh, yeah. Is that connection. Yeah, it makes some really fundamental questions, uh, you know, brings them to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, man, I, I really don't want to fall too far down the rabbit hole of talking about the Enlightenment and <laughs> oh, sorry, what? Rousseau. And... <laughs> okay. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, no, no. It's... Anyway, so uh, what, what do you, what do you want to talk about, Ryan? <laughs> Wait, what, bring us crashing back down to earth. Yes, uh, let's let's bring this back down to the plebeian level. Um, so there's actually a secondary title for this book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I didn't really connect the first time I read it, uh, but because you were in high school. Yes. What was the name of our AP teacher, by the way? I don't remember. I remember having Mrs. Cross in. One... Yes, that was her. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Um, Thanks, Mrs. Cross. <laughs> but the second title for this book is the Modern Prometheus. Uh, which really sheds a bit of light on two things. First of all, uh, we live by the, the saying that every story is like you're not telling new stories. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein feels like an original story, but it's still a semi-retelling of an existing mythology. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. The, the story of Prometheus, who is the one who's credited with the creation of man in terms of forming man from clay and then stealing fire and giving it to man, um, kind of against the wishes of the gods originally. This is Greek, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so we, you take that story, Prometheus' story, and we take Frankenstein, and he is essentially Prometheus and has gifted life unto a creature he's formed from clay again. Um, so I, I, for those out there who just, who feel like there's no original stories or anything, it's been that way for a really long time. Tell the story well. Mm -hmm. That's I what was, changes it. I, it's funny. I was just listening to a podcast about movies today and how uh, Hollywood kind of tends to trick themselves. They overthink things. Mm -hmm. Like, I got to have something new and exciting if I want to bring people into the theaters. They're That's talking how you get about Mandy. They're <laughs> true, which is <laughs> knuck and futz, as they say, um, as Kyle says. Mm -hmm. No, but um, they were talking about the recent Halloween sequel that's mm -hmm. in theaters right now and uh and the guy was like no there's a reason it's making 80 million dollars on its opening weekend it's because they understood this is a genre picture and you don't need to you don't need to reinvent the wheel you just need to build your wheel really really well mm -hmm. and people will come see it so you make your genre picture really well and people will come see it i think that's kind of what you're getting at yeah yeah it's it's encouragement to those who are authors who are creators in different forms that if you feel like I just can't figure out what's unique about me or what's unique about this or, or coming up with something original, just write, just do, just go and do that. Because even some of the greatest works like Frankenstein here are, are retellings of existing stories. So just do it. I'm going to Shia LaBeouf this right here. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. Do it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. <laughs> I still don't know the context around those gifts, but I think they're fantastic. They're fantastic. Uh, so, okay. Uh, let's. So, now that we've thoroughly prefaced this story for uh, 20 minutes, should we actually get into the plot? Maybe we should talk about the story itself. Um, <laughs> eh, whatever. <laughs> maybe a quote or two or something. <laughs> so, but well, let's, let's recap this a little bit because I was kind of interested. Kyle, Kyle and I were talking a little bit before uh, we ran the microphones. Um, and we mentioned it already, the frame story. I was 
uh, I had forgotten about the frame story and I thought it worked really well. Mm -hmm. um, it, as far as for me, it was kind of getting me into the classic mode and uh, getting me back into the language itself. But I, I thought it was also really good at uh, for building the tension and like, you know, this boat that's heading, heading up to into the Arctic Sea and uh, things are not going so well and they see these images of these you know figures on the dog sleds going by and it's it's all fantastic and he brings victor on board and this guy is kind of raving mad and he's you know he's talking about how if you make choices like i've made choices then you'll ruin everything forever and i, I can't tell you what i know because then you'll ruin the world and mm -hmm. it's just a great build up to the the proper the story proper mm -hmm. yeah um, i don't know yeah i love the frame story itself the other thing that the, one of the things the frame story did for me that i appreciated is it allowed our main characters that we're following in the story of victor uh, of victor and the monster uh to be completely open to whatever happening what do you mean um in the sense that victor could uh, we know that victor gets on the ship so victor like is alive but if, oh, we were, so if he's we're, gonna make it through the story to that point at least yes at least yeah. to this point but at any in, in mo most stories if like this if we're telling it from their perspective we know we're getting to the end of the book this character is alive at the end of the book yeah especially that's especially first person narratives things like that you know this person is alive all the way through this right um and it raises the stakes of what you're reading because you you only know that he gets to this point you don't know what's going to happen to get him there and if he's going to make it past what you're reading right this second. Right. It's it's great that the frame story comes back in as early as it does. You know, it's not mm -hmm. just like a, a one paragraph. Well, there's his story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sign off. <laughs> uh, you And so you still have a good chunk of book left. And you're like, oh, no. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen? Yep. That's great. Caught up. Uh, but then there's not just the story. There, there's not just the story within the story. There's the story within the story within the story. When Frankenstein starts, to, or sorry, Frankenstein, when the monster starts telling his tale about uh, living in the, the cottage mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Kyle, that. you were saying that was kind of throwing you off. Um, I mean, it wasn't but, throwing me off. It just was like, it's like you talked about with like a modern day editor or whatever. Like there'd be things that would smooth out a little bit more. It was like, I had to realize like, oh, we're going from here. We've changed to POVs. here. You know, we're, we're all the way down to third level inception here. <laughs> just like the perspective of where we're at yeah yeah um oh well, let's talk about okay how we got there so we've got this frame story the captain or yeah captain of the ship and they're searching for new lands and mm -hmm. instead they stumble across victor frankenstein chasing down the monster and he tells his story and his story was kind of of growing up with a semi-idyllic childhood in geneva and then he goes to school and he's super brilliant and he decides that he is going to create life and he's going to chase down the answer of what is it that actually animates flesh, you know, animal flesh, uh, humans, what, mm -hmm. whatever it is, what is it that actually gives them life? And uh, at, at the time when Mary Shelley was writing this, it wasn't that long ago that Benjamin Franklin had done his experiments with electricity. And I don't know, I, I won't pretend to know a ton about, the history of that particular event or the science around that. But I do know that we severely underestimate the shock waves that that sent, especially through Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and when people heard about Ben Franklin's experiments, it was a big friggin' deal. And, and so that's where in the movies, at least, you know, we have this idea of, yeah, he's going to get struck by lightning and it's going to bring him to life. But like, I guess my point isn't so much about the lightning because I don't know that that was ever in the book. I don't think it was. But my point is just that um, there were some serious uh, scientific breakthroughs happening, uh, kind of setting the scene for mm -hmm. for Mary Shelley writing this and, and what she's what she's doing. Um, where was I going with this? Where Why was I talking about this? Oh, yeah, because Victor Frankenstein is uh, he's putting together this monster. He's going to figure out what gives it life. In the movies, at least, it's lightning comes mm -hmm. in or animates it. One of the things that shocked me, though, was in the scene where the monster finally comes to life, there is no fanfare. Mm -hmm. He finishes. It's at like, like the very beginning of a chapter. It's in the first or second paragraph of uh, like chapter 
eight or nine or something like that. Um, and uh, and he's he says, oh, I, and I put it together, and then it opened its eyes, and I'm like, what? <laughs> where's where's my like where's, your where's, my, where's my Rita Repulsa like <laughs> make my creature grow and, like I wanted you know I want some fanfare so I was a little bit shocked at the lack of fanfare around the monster arising but as I read on for the paragraphs after that what a fantastic scene mm-hmm. where he's like I finished my thing it opened its eyes and I freaked the f- out yeah mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and and I ran away. And I got in my bed and, you know, and I, I pulled the covers up over my head, basically, and <laughs> closed the curtains around the bed and just like, just wait for everything to go away because he's so repulsed by this thing that he made. And then in the next paragraph, the curtains part and the monster's looking at him and you're like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, as you're reading it, you're, what's going on? I just thought that scene was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Uh, two things. The first being... Um, this is this is why this fits so well as a horror genre piece is because of the amount of tension and thrill that you you feel in and the danger that you feel Victor's in yeah here as well um, because we always we joke about it afterwards but as we're watching horror films or this people always make the dumbest decisions <laughs> My, your blanket covers and curtains are not going to protect you right, from right from anything and this is where that comes from. <laughs> So there's, you know, even I, I think it's just funny that that's always one of the key elements of any good horror film is somebody making a very stupid decision about just, how to protect themselves. I just, I'm just thinking of that commercial that's been playing recently about like there's like an axe murderer chasing these group of teens or whatever, and there's like a running car and they're trying to decide where to go, where to go, and the guy, one guy's like, "Let's go this way," and the girl's <laughs> like, "Shouldn't we get in the running car?" And he's like, "No, let's go hide behind the that the chainsaws. shed of chainsaws." Like, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful it's such a good commercial <laughs> yeah uh i think you pointed out something very interesting though one of the things about this that is so different if you were to write this today the first thing i would say that would be majorly different about this is the reasoning for frankenstein for victor making the monster mm-hmm. i guarantee you um because even as i was rereading this i'm like does this they, they bring up the the his his girl um, when he's a boy or whatever Elizabeth he, Elizabeth it, yeah you know he just he loves her I'm like oh yeah she's got to die so he has a reason to want to bring someone back to life type thing right and I'm like oh no no that that's not how that works in these like that that's how it works <laughs> nowadays no he it's it's a simple thirst for knowledge yeah it just drives him right into into doing that and that is an acceptable reasoning oh absolutely and but this is exactly what i was talking about earlier i'm gonna say the dreaded words once again this is um mary shelley writing from a romantic perspective and saying that the unbridled thirst for knowledge represented in the enlightenment is something that you know you have to be careful about and i'm i'm a full-throated supporter of the enlightenment go enlightenment you know (laughs) but i will say that the romantics had a point Maybe not as much of one as they thought, but I think they they had a point. It's, um, but that I think that's enough tension for me. Yeah, you know, or enough reason, enough motivation. I want to know if this can be done, and if so, how. Mm-hmm. Like that's enough motivation for me because I can recognize the impulse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so moving on with the story, we've created the monster. The monster's running around. Victor freaks out gets really ill his buddy shows up and kind of nurses him back to health uh they go back to geneva and the monster kills the it kills victor's little brother mm-hmm. um and frames uh the the not sister the the live-in non-sister right uh who gets executed for the crime and victor kind of cowardly cowardly yeah. decides not to uh tell people what had happened and who mm-hmm. was really responsible um but now he's decided there are two people that he cares about like that have been killed by the monster so now he's got to hunt it down yeah so now he's gonna hunt it down uh and then the the monster shows up uh when he's on his uh nature retreat in the mountains the monster shows up takes him to a cave in a glacier and they have a very long conversation which is absolutely fascinating. And mm-hmm. I don't know if we have time to get into now, unfortunately. Um, 
But if we if we had been smart, we would have spent our entire podcast on that conversation. That we still could. Yes. You know. But uh, let's see. If you only if you want to study just one section of this book, if you don't have time to read it all, go follow that portion. Oh yeah. If I were if I were compiling, and, and I'll bet uh, I've got the Oxford Book of uh, something or other around here. Anyway, if I were putting one in an anthology, if I were putting a section, I'd grab the two or three chapters from the glacier and mm-hmm. just throw them in. This is, yeah, this is it. So uh, anyway, so tell me about the conversation in the glacier. What's going on? Somebody, so I don't have to talk anymore. <laughs> so oh, no, let me rephrase that. So people don't have to listen to me anymore. No, I thought, nothing. I thought you were raising your hand, Kyle. Nope. So okay, fine. So yeah, what happens in the glacier is uh, the monster tells Victor about uh, what happened after he was brought to life, and he's so confused and scared, and he doesn't know what's going on. And uh, Victor, who is the only human face that he's seen, is obviously terrified, and he runs away and he abandons the creature. The creature ends up. Uh, wandering the countryside and finds it's winter time and so he needs shelter and he finds shelter in this hovel it's like a and a little add-on at the side of this cottage and he's able to winter there unbeknownst to the family in the cottage and that's it, through a crack in the wall is how he learns language and literature and uh, he kind of observes this family unit interacting and during that time, he sees what the relationship is supposed to look like in a family. Mm-hmm. And as he sees this, he becomes more and more bitter toward Victor, who he realizes completely doesn't, abandoned him. Doesn't he have access to his journals as well? And he yeah, understands he gets, the nature of his creator and like right. how he was actually created and basically understands like that he himself is somewhat of an abomination. Right. And I mean, this is where he talks about, and this is where we get those references from Paradise Lost that we were talking about Mm -hmm. and how he either reading through it or, or witnessing through the crack and being exposed to Paradise Lost, he empathizes most with the, with Satan's character in that, in the fact that his creator had rejected him and cast him aside. And so, which is interesting because most people who read that, especially Christianity with Christian backgrounds, that's not the character you're supposed to empathize with. It's not the person you're supposed to connect the to. The monster, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Satan, the Satan character, but this monster is doing that. And it's a commentary from oh, I see. Yeah, Mary yeah. Shelley. Um, it's basically Mary Shelley's version of Paradise Lost or of the creation story. So is this, because is the this monster like... then goes on and wants Victor to create a, a mate for him. For him. And so you're, th- you know, he <laughs> so he, no, he doesn't want to be Satan. He doesn't want to be the cast aside right, right, creation. Right. He wants to be Adam. I was gonna say this is uh, this is the 1818 version of Wicked. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no, no, she was the good guy all along. Yeah, I hate that play. But yeah, he doesn't want to be he doesn't want to be the Satan character in Paradise Lost. He wants to be Adam. He wants to be the creation that the creator loves and supports and creates a mate for. Indeed. And so that's what he uh, agrees to do. Um, he agrees to make a mate for the monster, and he leaves, and he travels back to wherever Scotland or something. I can't even recall. Um, and he creates a, a a little lab, and he gathers up all the body parts, and he's going to create a female monster, uh, as uh, as Genesis might say, and helpmate for the monster. <laughs> and um, he is almost done and he's looking at this thing that he's about to give life to and uh, is so disgusted that he basically hacks it apart again throws it in a boat goes out to the middle of the lake and dumps it over Mm -hmm. into the lake and the monster finds out the monster (laughs) freaks out and kills Clairval uh, Frankenstein's best friend Um, and then is that when they have the conversation about uh, like I'll, I'll see you on your wedding night or yes. whatever it yeah. is because he's going to go back and marry Elizabeth uh, but he just needed to do that task first and so the monster says well, I'll, I'll see you on your wedding night and thus commences one of the greatest scenes in all of literature as far as I'm concerned is when he gets married to Elizabeth and it's supposed to be this joyous day and he spends the entire day just terrified yeah he's wringing his hands and he doesn't know what's going to happen that night so they go to their their honeymoon cottage 
she goes to bed and he is kind of pacing around in the yard um, and wondering what what kind of what form this confrontation is going to take place and then he realizes i was never the target because i took away this uh this companion for the monster and now the monster is going to do the same to me and so he's running back to the house and the scream oh no and the mm-hmm. monster has killed elizabeth fantastic yep so uh and that's that's uh what else do we have after that as far as the end of the book basically that's they go from there is where they pick up the chase and we kind of connect the frame story to what we've done here the yeah, yeah. um and we get one final at the end here we get one final connection between uh victor and the monster and the fact that victor dies on the boat yep and then as they're, they're sending him out the monster appears on the on, ship on the, to oh get, right 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 to kind of give away to to say his farewell to his creator and he's kind of weeping over his yeah, corpse which is which is perfect it's it's beautiful because it's so much contrast to what he has done to the man as well and what has been done to him the 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 beauty of one of the biggest uh, draws to this book for me here is that conflict between Victor and the monster is based in the desire for what Kyle was saying earlier, that love and appreciation um, between the two of them and uh, acknowledgement. Because if Victor just hated the monster, like, I don't think, I don't think it would be the same. And the fact that the monster still has this desire for appreciation from his creator, that he still weeps at the end, matters. Like, that's a big deal. That's an emotional connection that showcases that when he did the other terrible things of murdering people, it wasn't this senseless, mindless monster that Frankenstein has kind of become in Hollywood and things like that. It's an act of choice that uh, that the monster goes to inflict a uh, punishment. It might be childish, but it's still an act of choice that he made, uh, which makes him a great, makes this monster a great villain, and by far, in my opinion, more threatening and scary than the Hollywoodized version of him. Oh, for sure. Um, a much more interesting version. It's uh, it's like the difference between, uh, speaking of the Halloween movie that just came out, this remake of Halloween. Um, gosh, I, I'm going to go a roundabout way to make my point here, uh, which is that uh, one of the reasons the monster is so interesting. Um, the original Halloween, Michael Myers goes on a killing spree. They try to stop him. They stop him. And then we have like 10 sequels. I don't know how many, but a bunch of sequels. And one of the things that marks the sequels is that the sequels are constantly trying to understand Michael Myers. They're showing his childhood. They're kind of tracking, well, what, what is it that turned this person into the, into such a killing machine? And then the remake is like, no, screw that. He is just a killing machine. There's it. it, The movie openly mocks the idea that you can understand evil Mm-hmm. and uh and it just has him killing people and that's all that he does um this one takes the tack of the sequels it wants to understand the monster uh which i think is uh is pretty interesting it's a good way uh, to go one two movies to watch with this frame of mind is actually prometheus uh-huh. and alien covenant oh man you're this is the part of the program where kyle defends prometheus uh and creates a firestorm on reddit <laughs> <laughs> I'm not defending Prometheus. I'm oh, saying okay. that's the whole point of the movie, though. Is right. What what we're getting at in this story, Prometheus and Alien Covenant is a modern day Frankenstein. Is basically what what uh, really Scott's trying to do. Right. Is creation trying to understand where they come from, uh, and then ultimately the creation destroying their creator. Right. So, anyways. That's really cool. I mean, there's a bunch of references in those two movies to these same time period poets, Byron and Osmandias or and Percy Shelley. I mean, uh, they actually quote Osmandias in there. But if you look at it from a Frankenstein perspective, it opens up those stories a whole lot more, which is really cool. Nice. Um, All right. I have one other thing. Did we get to are we good on the, the synopsis? We good on the story? Did we kind of, we kind of so. got the end of that. All right. So I had an idea. None of us had read this since high school. We all read it basically for probably AP English, right? Or was it just uh, an English class for you? No, I actually just read it 
You just read just it for fun. Yeah, okay. Because I think we were reading something stupid in English, and so I was like, I'd rather read this one. <laughs> um, this is our third Chinua Achebe we were probably, book. We were probably reading To Kill a Mockingbird for uh, the fifteenth yeah. time in my <laughs> English courses, so I was like, eh. Anyway, so but my idea was, uh, since this is a book that's constantly read in high school classes, I, I pulled up all of the um, essay questions oh. from the AP English Lit test. Oh boy! From uh, it goes from 1986 up to 2015. And uh, anyway, so I, I thought I would grab a sampling of those. <laughs> so they, here's one from 1990. Are you guys ready? Choose a novel or play that depicts a conflict between a parent or a parental figure and a son or daughter. Write an essay in which you analyze the sources of the conflict and explain how the conflict contributes to the meaning of the work. Avoid plot summary. Uh, what a fantastic book to answer a question like that. That's uh, okay. So that and that's a kind of an obvious one. What about this one from uh, 2013? A buildings roman or a coming of age novel recounts the psychological or moral development of its protagonist from youth to maturity when this character recognizes his or her place in the world. Select a single pivotal moment in the psychological or moral development of the protagonist of a buildings roman. Then write a well organized essay. Blah 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 blah. So, yeah, like this. Would you write that about Victor or would you write that about the monster? Hundred percent, me, Victor. Although I could definitely see how the essay would be great from the monster's point of view too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Would Would you do the monster? My initial inclination was the monster. That was, that's why I was leaning in as well. Uh, because, and it's mainly because his realization is a little more obvious, um, mm-hmm. and his timeline is a lot more condensed um, in terms of his realization and everything. So I think it would be a lot easier to connect those dots than it would be for Victor. The the tighter story, easier to pull from? Because so much of Victor's story that we get, that we're told that his early life, that early portion is just saying, hey, I had a good life and I'm smart. Like, I, my, his development into his place in the world, it doesn't really, I don't really feel a ton of that in his story, um, trying to find his place in the world. It's just what his accomplishment of bringing life to the monster, whereas the monster being created and trying right. to figure out I am an abomination. Where do I fit in this world? To me, is the more intriguing of those okay. two. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I can. That's defensible. Absolutely. I passed all my AP tests. I'm good. Did you, I, <laughs> that was the only one that I didn't get a three on. <laughs> I got a four on the AP English test. Thank you very much. All the others. Oh no, that's not true, because AP Biology. I, I got a two. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and surprisingly, I got a three on. That. Did you really? <laughs> yes, I passed them all. Wow. Oh, that's right. I do remember that. Ryan and I had the same AP bio teacher. He was 100% worthless, but at least Ryan was a dedicated enough student to try to learn something on his own. I did not. Um, I did not pass the test. So, um, Anyway, I, I guess, so I, I'm not going to read through any more of these questions, but you can go, you can go check it out. Just Google AP English Lit essay questions, and you can pull up this document and others like it that'll go through that. I The reason I had this idea, well, it, it's not the reason, but the reason I continued with the idea is that I, I feel like Frankenstein is the perfect novel to answer just about any of these questions because it is, you can take it as on a really low level kind of personal basis, like close to the ground. I mean, not low level in that way, but like um, on a really personal basis, you can talk about Victor, Victor and the monster and their individual experiences, but you can also blow it up and talk about how uh, Victor represents the progress of man and what he's able to achieve and how he deals with, um, you know, all these scientific discoveries and creations, etc. Or you can do the same thing from the monster's perspective and what does it mean for mankind as a whole to kind of grow into itself and understand its place in the universe. And uh, Anyway, uh, what what a book. Yeah. What a book. That's, uh, that's all. I, I that, feel like we could just leave it with that. Say the sound you're hearing right now is the groans of hundreds of high school students who were hoping that we would answer a couple of those on on air, so Should, so they could, you know, use are, it for their essays. Do you want to? No, do I you, really don't. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Me neither. Uh, yeah, you write your own damn essay and then put it on <laughs> put it on uh, Reddit, and then we'll critique it. And... We'll tell you what score you'd get if we were grading AP tests. Oh, abs- oh, we'd be the best AP test graders ever. Yeah. Eh, there you go. C plus. C plus. C plus. 
forever. You're getting a three. Exactly. Everybody gets threes. You showed up, you get a three. See, we're the best graders ever. <laughs> so, uh, all right, let's let's go ahead and leave it there. It's a little bit shorter episode, but you know what? We've done a lot of yeah. long, long, long episodes. Uh, we could, again, we could spend an entire episode on that glacier, but uh, maybe we oughtn't. And length has never been our strong suit. <laughs> Speak for yourself. No. Uh, okay. So thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, and we will be back with, uh, I don't know, Goosebumps, Farseer, whatever other crap a, we got going on. A book. <laughs> with, with a book. We're going to be talking about books. A book. Forever. Um, we have, what else do we have coming up? Uh, the Bravo team, Blue team has uh, Dune coming up. They have something else. I don't know. You can go look on Reddit. And are they still doing Dresden? Dre- they have one more Dresden book to get through. Yeah. So got a lot of stuff coming up. We have some surprise stuff coming up. And once again, if you are a patron, look forward to some fun Dungeons and Dragons shenanigans on Patreon. Uh, anyway, thanks everybody for s- supporting the show. Patreon.com slash legendarium. Let's go join the conversation at the legendarium.reddit.com. Um, tw- uh, Twitch, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I feel like I'm having a stroke. I'm just shouting out. That's what out. social media is. It's just <laughs> it's, it's a, having a broadcasted stroke. A giant societal stroke. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. MySpace.